Hey everyone, this is Giordano from The Juice Media. Welcome back to The Juice Media Podcast, a companion to the Honest Government ad series. This is episode 17, which is a US election special, dedicated to all the shitfuckery we covered in our last two Honest Government ads, from slowing down the mail service to fueling conspiracies like QAnon. This absolutely crucial election is now only days away and there is so much at stake. So I wanted to make this podcast to help people understand what to watch out for, not just on the election day, but more importantly in the days and weeks following the election which is when the real shit show will unfold. To help us understand what we're in for in the weeks ahead, I've invited a local inhabitant of the USSA to come and talk to us, my friend James from the internet. James is a senior video producer at ACT TV, a huge political nerd and also a huge fan of the Honest Government ads, which is how he ended up contributing some guest writing on our Trump 2020 episode. Alright, time's short so let's get right into it. I hope you enjoy this chat and I'll catch you on the other end. Welcome to the Juice Media Podcast, James from the internet. Mellow greetings. Good to have you here. Um, I came on uh, your show a few months ago. Um, I'll put links to the, in the video description to your work and uh, the show that you do. Um, and it's great to have you here on the Juice Media Podcast to talk about uh, our latest Honest Government ad about QAnon, but more specifically about the US election, which is just around the corner, which I don't know about you, but... Yeah, I mean, I kind of feel like it's it's a total shit show in the making, but at the same time, probably the most important election of our lifetimes. How does it feel at the moment being there? Uh, you've got a magical way of kind of being able to describe the shit show as it evolves. Can you give us a glimpse of what it's like there at the moment, four days uh, out from the election now? I think I'll start with number one. I'm exhausted. I'm I am literally more tired than I've ever been in my entire life. And it's just the constant messaging and onslaught and the because the nature of this election is you know so important and everybody's like on the edge of their teeth that it's literally the the stress of it is just grinding people down like if you're if you're not here in america like you really can't understand there's just like a general malaise over the whole country and uh i think for me because i do this for a living and i know what's coming next i know that election night isn't the end it's the beginning and there's going to be a whole nother, you know, two months of legal maneuvering and anger and social groups and clashing. So it's not like I'm looking at, you know, Tuesday is election day. And, you know, finally, oh, this chapter's over. Like, it's just the beginning of the yeah. shit show. That's when we hit the overdrive button. Can you unpack that a little bit, James? So when you say that the shit show is going to start after the election, there's a lot of um, movement happening in the Supreme Court in the various states and also at the federal level. Um, and of course, in 2000, in the, the Bush versus Gore election, the Supreme Court decided the outcome of the election. Are we looking at a repeat of Bush v. Gore at the Supreme Court for this election? Oh. What are the signs? Oh, yeah. That's the plan. Well, uh, I, I think number one, you're, you're, you're probably your number one lead on this is that three of the current serving Supreme Court justices now, which is Roberts, Kavanaugh, and our new friend ACB, Amy Coney Barrett, uh, all three of them actually had a hand in the Bush-Gore recount and the legal wrangling in Florida. And actually at the time, uh, it, was a fl it was flipped. It was the other way. So Kavanaugh at the time was an attorney working for the Bush campaign who was pressuring uh, the FEC and then eventually it went to the Supreme Court uh, saying that any ballots received, regardless of whether or not they even had a postmark on them, should be counted because they're American citizens and it's the will of the people. Mm -hmm. And now, you know, lo and behold, he just wrote, you know, the uh, the opinion that barred Wisconsin from being allowed to include votes that are received after Election Day, which seems kind of ridiculous when you think about the fact that four months ago, Trump and his postmaster general were removing mail sorting machines from Midwestern and Rust Belt states. And now if your ballot is received after election day, they're not going to count it in Wisconsin. And there are already similar suits like this happening in Pennsylvania, North Carolina, Florida. And that's just that's just one avenue, so to speak. You know, um, after the election, obviously, what will happen is then they will start going over individual ballots and districts. And they will start working to discount ballots. And they'll say, oh, well, this ballot was sent in the wrong envelope, or they didn't fill in the whole bubble, or they didn't put their middle initial, and boom, your, your vote gets discounted. And this works for absentee ballots, mail-in ballots, uh, early voting ballots. And they can pluck through them one at a time and discount them. And, and I think other than the fact that 
you know, you got the three people on the Supreme Court now. Uh, Trump and uh, McConnell have pushed through so many judges now on a federal level. I want to say uh, about 26 percent of all seated federal judges now have been seated by Trump and McConnell in the last four years. We're talking about hundreds. And, that, and that's all your fe- your federal. Yes, yeah, it's, it's all your appellate courts, all of your federal level courts. Mm-hmm. So so they've definitely been working to stack the appellate level courts, which are usually the first uh, the, the first branch that, that the state election boards will go to when uh, civil civic groups mm-hmm. will, you know, they'll file a lawsuit and say, oh, we want, you know, these results and the tabulations to be public. And then that gets kicked up and it eventually goes to like a state appellate court and they'll kick it to a federal appellate court and then they'll kick it to the Supreme Court. So you have to be able to establish that chain of judges who will essentially rule in the same manner or all decide to kick the can. And they've been loading the courts. So you got the loaded federal courts, you got the loaded Supreme Courts, and then you have the fact that uh, the Trump campaign has just recently pivoted all of their spending. And if you watch the polls, there are a lot of states that are close right now in the United States, uh, especially you know Florida, North Carolina. Like These are huge states for Trump. Yeah. Pennsylvania. And well, he's pulled now all of his uh his his buys, his inter his um his advertising buys, his commercial buys from Florida and North Carolina, even though they're both pivot states. And he's moving it to states like Michigan. And the reason being, in a state like Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, who's the governor, is not gonna play ball with him. And she's gonna drag her feet and she's gonna have, you know, her legal team uh making Trump wait forever for stuff. And meanwhile, he knows that in Florida and North Carolina, he'll get DeSantis and DeWine and they'll instantly play ball. Like the day after the election, they'll just turn everything over to the FEC. And he knows he doesn't have that problem. So he's not even going to bother advertising in Florida because he knows, oh, I got a 3% margin because I could just whack, you know, 130,000 votes with DeSantis playing ball with me in the state federal uh, the state and federal election boards. So they took all their spending and they moved it to the, the Rust Belt swing states. So you put it all together and it definitely looks like the plan is to have a protracted legal battle in December going into January to discount votes. So essentially the the, the strategy is to let the courts um, decide the outcome of the election. And I mean, look, for all his faults, Trump is actually mod- modestly honest about the strategy. But he's actually said we want the you know the the, the federal courts the, the court systems to decide the outcome of the election so that we know an ele- a winner on election night i don't know if that's going to be possible um a lot of people are saying that um that even in the best case scenario we're not going to know the outcome of the election until the end of next week so friday thursday friday kind of thing um because a lot some states are some of the court cases that you've mentioned are actually voting in favor of extending the deadline for mail-in ballots. For example, Pennsylvania, North Carolina, ballots um, post by, by election day could be it can be received up to three days later. In North Carolina, um, uh, nine days later. And just in the latest one is Minnesota, which has just ruled that mail-in ballots can be counted if they arrive at... Uh, sorry, will not be counted if they arrive after 8 p.m. on election day. So Minnesota is actually... It's fucking crazy how you have different laws for each state. But give us a, you've just mentioned that, you know, some, one of the things um, that's kind of happening is, uh, you know, people are boarding up shops. Everything is kind of closing down. It's, it feels like there's a hurricane, like a natural disaster is about to hit. Oh, it's a hurricane. Yeah. And it's a disaster. It's just not natural. <laughs> so can you give us a little bit of a sense of what, what's happening there on the ground in preparation for election week? What are, the, what are the, some of the signs that you've noticed? Well, you know, in most years, uh, you know, when election week rolls around, uh, it's and much like much like what you're talking about, like here in America, most of your polling locations are either at a local firehouse or a local school. And, you know, the year when it's election year, the custodians go and they roll out these big old clunky machines from a closet. And, you know, they set up the voting where you're all oh, it's going to be voting season. Mm-hmm. And uh, this year, uh, like right now, if you go driving through New York City and you go drive up Sixth Avenue, uh Macy's, the NBA store, Saks Fifth Avenue, their windows are already shuttered with plywood like there is a hurricane coming uh, because the assumption is that on Tuesday night, it's going to turn into the purge. This isn't just happening in New York City. This is happening in a lot of cities in America. Like they're bracing for impact. Uh, People on the police force are getting letters telling them that 
no vacation time will be honored next week because there's going to be extra shifts and working in extra rotations. Um, you know, the, uh, the leader of the Oath Keepers, which is a large militia here in America, and I know we have many, many tremendously fine militias here. I know we're known for our militias. It's, they're tremendous. Uh, the Oath Keepers are probably the most tremendous of all the tremendous militias because they're comprised directly of uh, former military and former police officers who have, quote, taken an oath to support and defend the Constitution. And now that they've retired or have been thrown off the force or whatever, uh, they have decided that they want to continue maintaining their oath to protect the Constitution, and they join the Oath Keepers. So the Oath Keepers is approximately 40,000 veterans and retired cops, all of whom who have hundreds of hours of range time, who have already said they're going to be positioning themselves at polling stations across the country. So we're literally going to have, you know, large Ford pickup trucks outside of polling locations in rural, majority black locations filled with white dudes with AR-15s wearing body armor. So uh, if you want to know how uh, the American election is shaping up, that's 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 kind of how it's shaping up. Well, I mean, this election, but also American democracy. I mean, this, these are the kind of things we're used to seeing in, you know, in countries where democracy is kind of really not in a good shape. You know, the, the number of obstacles that have been thrown in the way of people voting. I mean, for a country that claims to be a democracy, it's insane. I mean, the fact that these the courts are literally deciding the rules of the election less than a week away from the fucking election. I mean, that's insane. They're going to be deciding it a month after the election. Yeah. What the hell are you that's talking about? Like, like you see, but people don't know we're not a democracy. Like, we're we're, yeah, we're a constitutional republic. Right. Democracy is just a marketing term that we have along with liberty and freedom. Right. These are all marketing terms. Mm -hmm. And the the reason why you and the, and the EU have the advantage comparative to, to the shit show we have here is because we only have two parties. And the problem with only having two choices is you eventually get diametric opposition and you get everything is either black or white. It's either good or it's evil. You're part of the solution or you're part of the problem. Mm -hmm. um, you get this extremism happens when you only have two choices and things get pushed further apart and they get more polarized. At least in other civilized parts of the world, you know, y'all have parliamentary systems and you have to form, you know, working governments out of coalitions. Yeah. And here you're either good or evil. And that's it. Yeah. No, I no, I 100 percent agree. I mean, the, the, the parliamentary Westminster parliamentary system that we have, although it has flaws, is definitely uh, very good. I mean, one of the things that I've noticed, and this is going a little bit on a tangent, but honestly, I think it's at the core of the problem and you've really put your finger on it, is the, the, the voting system. Every time I read even really good analyses of the election, it's very much like, oh, this will detract votes from the Republicans and this will uh, favor the Democrats. And it's like, it shouldn't be about just two parties. There are, I mean, and you do have other parties. You do have third parties and independent candidates. candidates. But I mean, they do, they are running, they are on the ballot, but the system that you have there doesn't really allow you to vote for them unless you're prepared to, quote, throw your vote away. So... Here in Australia, we have a preferential voting system, which I think in, a, in the US you call ranked choice voting. We have it in one state right now. We got it passed in one state. Wow. Which state was that? Uh, I believe it was Maine just passed ranked choice voting. And wow. they're, they're slowly getting it passed in voting districts and counties and places like New York. But statewide, I believe Maine is going to be the first state that has one. But we can always fact check and delete this portion of the interview if I was wrong. <laughs> No, well, I mean, look, that's that's really good. Look, and I don't want to say it's like a it's like a, a panacea or a solution because we have it. And look at the government that we have. Like, you know, it's not just because you have preferential voting doesn't mean you it solves all the problems because people still don't understand. Even here in Australia, people don't understand it, don't understand how how it works. And I think ultimately, this is why we made an honest government ad about it on the eve of the last election. There is a real political illiteracy when it comes to our own voting system here. But we have a very good voting system where if you think that both Joe Biden and Donald Trump are shit, uh, you don't have to give your first vote to them. You can vote number one for your, you know, the, the, the good candidate who might be in a party or might be an independent. And if that candidate doesn't have enough votes to reach a, a majority on their own, then your second preference flows on to whoever you put second on the ballot, which might be Donald Trump or it might be Joe Biden. But either way, um, it allows you to vote for other people without throwing your vote away. Right. But but that's what we do, because it, it makes it much easier to manipulate. There's no, fewer funny. there's fewer random factors that that you have to account for. It's it's much easier to have two party tribalism 
than have multiple ideas and ideologies trying to find places where they can at least find some form of agreement. And like the only time Republicans and Democrats in America agree, it's number one, when it's time to pass a spending bill, or number two, when it's time to make it more difficult for a third party to get on the ballot somewhere. Mm. It's the only time Republicans and Democrats agree. So look, just just going back, because I think this is this is the key thing for people to understand. What do you want to say to like people who haven't voted yet? Like, is there still enough time to go and vote by mail? What should you be doing? Because basically what you've explained to us is we're heading into a, a situation where the courts are going to try and decide the outcome of this election. And it'll all hinge on, I suppose, swing states where there are votes that are in dispute. And those votes will be the ones that haven't been received by the deadline or, or mail-in voting, mailing votes. Is it fair to say that if you really want your vote to be counted at this point, you should just go and drop it off in person or make sure to vote on election day? Is that a fair... I mean, at this point, yeah. I mean, we're, we're talking about we're four days out from the election now. And in a lot of states, you know, they're just now having courts decide whether or not votes received after election day will count. So if you want to be guaranteed to have your vote counted, to received and counted at this point, you either need to drop it off at a at a you know at a, at a local office, or you need to go to a polling station. Uh, and I know this seems ridiculous and it seems counter to democracy because if you have an election day and if you vote before on election day, your vote should count. Yet all of a sudden, now if you vote the day before election day and throw a stamp on it, throw it in the mail, it might not count. Yeah, because it's inconvenient for specific candidates and specific parties in specific states. So at this point, regardless of where you live in America, and regardless of whether you think you're, you know, your candidates winning or losing by 30 points, uh, you really need to do that. And, you know, we have certain states you were talking before about the mail-ins and, and the problems. You know, we have states here like Oregon and Washington, they, they're literally all mail-in voting. Mm -hmm. Like, that's it. That's the whole voting system. And, you know, they had a lot of people displaced by fire. So they just have people who are getting back to their homes now or mail routes that are just now starting to circulate full time. Like at this point, you got to take that to a ballot box because mm -hmm. you don't know if it's going to get there in time. And if it does, you don't know if it's going to be counted. Mm -hmm. So democracy. Dem <laughs> I love that. Um, I, <laughs> um, democracy. So if you're hearing this uh, and you haven't voted yet, do that. Note, by the way. I I've, I don't I'm not telling people who to vote for like I, I kind of uh, you know I feel like that's 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 your choice but I, the key thing here is make sure your vote is counted vote make sure your vote is counted and then I would say probably the third point is make sure all the votes are counted and that's going to rely on really people being aware and I'm, I'm and I know we've just already spoken about this but I just want to underscore it again in <laughs> 2000 the Supreme Court decided to stop the recount of votes it was cl it was so close between gore and bush um uh, like we're talking about hundreds of votes difference very it was like small. 134 yeah. votes in one county and all they needed to do was just recount the votes um and instead what happened and i didn't know the story until uh recently while i was researching the q on video um that uh that that vote ultimately the supreme court stopped the recount but before it stopped it there was a mob of people who actually stormed the recounting offices uh, and prevented the recounts from going ahead by literally banging on the doors and they stopped people from moving shuffling boxes of ballots about so that they could count them um and these are all Republican operatives. They were po kind of posing as a as a crowd of protesters. It's known as the Brooks Brothers riot. I mean, this is probably common knowledge to you, but a lot of people don't know about this. We're looking at a repeat of that. So I feel like this is one of those cases where people need to be aware of history so that we don't allow it to repeat. Can you speak a little bit about how what people can do in the days ahead to ensure, A, that all votes are counted, and B, that the Supreme Court doesn't steal the election either way? Ooh, that that sir, that's the that's the sixty four thousand dollar question. Honestly, um, you know, up until a few years ago, I would have told you that there was a concrete way to do that. I, and honestly, we we are so far off the edge of the map here in America. Like Trump has just been driving in one direction, and it's straight to no common sense town. And we've just been traveling that way for so long that honestly, I I, I wish I could tell you. Like it used to be, you could you know, phone your congressman and, you know, make those phones ring off the hook or, you know, hey, you could deliver, you know, boxes of petitions in front of a TV camera and, you know, it would make quite the sight on CNN. 
And now you've literally got nutters shooting each other in the streets. And, you know, the police are just like, come on, everybody, just keep going. Just keep going. I, um, I don't know. I, I honestly don't know. And, and that's, that's really scary. Like, um, I, I see a lot of people are preparing, but more in a, in a localized sense. Like I see a lot of locales and communities and groups and, and people are going, Oh, you know, we're going to, we're going to go and rally at this place with, you know, our congressional rep. You know, like like AOC's congressional district is in the Bronx in New York. And they're going to have a big rally, but it's going to be at you know someplace that's somewhat safe and protected. It's um, I, I don't know honestly that that there's an answer. I I don't know. It, we're at the point now where this is literally going to be in the hands of, you know, some some state controllers, some state election boards, some county officials, and and federal appellate judges. I mean, I would say that um. You definitely want to report anything going on at a polling location. Uh, I know that is something that people can do. If there's, you know, a Chevy pickup truck outside your polling location with four guys in body armor and AR-15s, like you should probably call the state election board or the police because that's voter intimidation. But honestly, once it gets to the the back rooms of of state houses and courthouses, you know, here in America we don't have direct representation. It, it's not a thing. Like, like once it moves to the back room, it's, you know, the it's like peasants standing outside the castle and, you know, you just wait until they blow the horns and the drawbridge comes down. They go, da, 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 da. and the, whoever's on the white horse that rides out, that's the person who's taxing you for the next four hope, years. Like, I, that's where I, we're at. I hope you make a movie one day, James, because your, your, <laughs> your, um, these little vignettes that you create of the United States, uh, political sort of, sort of culture and society is just, I find them depressingly, uh, entertaining. <laughs> Um, but they're not they're not inaccurate i love them can i just i just want to make one point um you know I, I, the reason i cite the the brooks brothers riots and the precedent of 2000 is because yes i'm kind of raising the alarm we're saying like shit's about to go down but i really want to anchor it in in reality in like history this has this has already happened it's not a it's not a theory it's not a, a sort of fantasy there is it's it, it's based on you know fact on the other side of the political spectrum, they also have their own warning. They're also talking about, um, you know, there's a conspiracy here to steal the election from the left, the radical left and all of that. So both sides are saying the same thing about each other. Um, this is what Donald Trump Jr. said recently. Uh, he said, the radical, quote, the radical left are laying the groundwork to steal this election from my father, President Donald Trump. They are planting stories that President Trump will have a landslide lead on election night, but will lose when they finish counting the mail-in ballots. Their plan is to add millions of fraudulent ballots that can cancel your vote and overturn the election. We cannot let that happen. We need every able-bodied man and woman to join the army for Trump's election security operation. This Can you unpack that a little bit for us? I mean, First of all, I just want to say, is there any evidence, has any evidence come out that there is, that there are fraudulent ballots or there is a plan to add millions of fraudulent ballots? Is there, a, is there any sort of historical precedent to justify this kind of thing? Uh, I, I believe in the last 10 years, the rate of uh, illegal voting and illegal balloting is somewhere at 0.00004% of all ballots received and votes cast were done so in a fraudulent manner. And two thirds of those in court were proven that they weren't uh, purposeful or by design. It's just not something they do. Like like the Trumps make it sound like, you know, like, like trouble. Oh, they're sending millions of ballots to illegal immigrants in California and they can't even read English. And you know that the Nancy Pelosi and the Democrats show them what bubble to fill out and they mail it back and that's how they win America. And like, it's like the most ridiculous fucking thing in the world. Like, That's a great in, Alex in states, impersonation, by the way. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, like in states where they mail people ballots, they mail the ballot to the person. It's not like a ballot comes to your house and says, you know, to Fred or resident. Like they mail them out like fucking penny savers or circulars like that's not a thing like so in states where they mail them to everybody they mail them to a specific name at a specific address in states where they don't do that you have to contact your election board and have them sent it's in much the same way that everybody in the military votes because you know there's 230,000 american soldiers 
that are, you know, stationed either in states or countries that aren't their actual state of residence, and they all vote absentee ballot. It's the same exact thing. Like, literally the same exact thing. Like, there were GIs voting, you know, filling out voter cards inside bunkers outside of Normandy like 80 years ago. And, and somehow those managed to get mailed in and counted on time. You know, but now all of a sudden mail-in votes are an evil criminal conspiracy cooked up by George Soros and the radical left. You know, the radical left, like Nancy Pelosi, the, the head of Antifa, who, you know, when she's not wearing $1,700 shoes and eating $30 fucking bars of ice cream, you know, she's rocking a baklava and a Maltov and burning buildings, yelling, no lords, no masters, like... There is no, I'm the radical yeah, left. I was gonna say, I'm a actually, jackhole with a microphone talking about voting. Like, yeah. that's it. Mm -hmm. Like, that's the radical. Look, you're looking, I'm the radical left. Yeah. Ooh, no, and, spooky. And, you know, that's a really good point. I, I think, I think you probably are. I mean, I, I've seen you know, oh, I am. some of the kind of things. And I just want to emphasize that when I asked you, what can people do? You didn't say, yeah, we need to get out in the streets and fucking, you know, punch some Nazis. And, you know, you're, you're basically saying vote and let's, try and you know as best we can actually make this democracy thing work so the best way to get around this is to vote vote early if you haven't already we we've made videos where we're literally telling people vote now don't wait vote you know today that was two months ago so if you still haven't voted please fucking go and vote i assume you voted james uh you know we, I, I and we, i had, to, I had to vote. australia going for fuck's sake please do your thing and vote okay <laughs> for the love of god yeah. vote well, because any votes that aren't uh, in by the 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 deadline are going to be decided by the supreme court system which has been stacked very strongly in favor of trump and it looks like uh, i mean brett kavanaugh and uh, has made some rulings i think in the wisconsin one uh, which are really dodgy. Um, you, people can look into that. And it's a bit detailed to go into it now, but he even cited Bush versus Gore as a precedent when that Supreme Court case, I don't know if people know, they actually said, do not cite this case as a precedent in the future. Like this is th this, this <laughs> ruling is not to be cited as a precedent. Kavanaugh just used that as a precedent to vote against uh, the Wisconsin and, uh, voting and, and not only that, but when Kavanaugh was working... Uh, to get all the Bush boots slammed through. Again, Kavanaugh literally was writing legal briefs stating that any votes received, regardless of what day they were received mm -hmm. on, regardless of how many days after the election, regardless of whether or not they even had a postmark, mm -hmm. should be yeah. counted so it's not because even American democracy <laughs> requires that all yeah. votes be counted. And all of a sudden he's like, oh, we can't count those yeah. votes. Like, So he's not even what? consistent with his <laughs> own... He, he's not even consistent with his own rulings. I mean, this is, it, it's really alarming to see a Supreme Court that is so, um, that has really lost its kind of moral compass in terms of the judiciary. It's no longer an independent arm of government. This is one of the things that we've seen with the Trump administration that's really been purging and carving out the judiciary, firing a lot of the inspector generals. Uh, William Barr do, has become basically Trump's personal lawyer. He's not He's not there as an attorney general. So there's so much at stake for domestic stuff. There's so much at stake for the, the world because even this fact on the 4th of November, the day after the election, the U.S. formally exits the Paris Agreement. And whilst I don't want to imply that, you know, the climate talks and the summits are this kind of like holy grail of solution to climate change, it is absolutely an essential component of that. And the U.S. leaving that agreement is absolutely going to set the world back, whereas Biden at least is going to keep America in the Paris Accord. He's got a net zero emissions pledge by 2050. And this is a really important thing for Australia, uh, where we have a government that has flouted international agreements on climate. We're really fuck we're going to make an honest government out about this because it's absolutely shameful. But uh, one of the things that Biden has said is that he will, quote, use every tool of American foreign policy to push the rest of the world to raise their ambitions alongside the United States, including including imposing carbon adjustment fees or quotas on carbon intensive goods from countries that are failing to meet their climate and environmental obligations. That's us, motherfuckers. So especially on climate policy, um, a Biden um, uh, administration would be better. And once they can get in, I, along with you, I'm sure James will spend the next four years criticizing and, and holding that government to account. We're not going to be like, yeah, 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 kind of thing. I mean, we spent eight years criticizing Obama's administration before Trump came in. So it's really about holding these governments to account. But um, how are you navigating this, um, this aspect? Because I know you're not a fan of the Democratic Party either. And 
you, you've kind of you know you've been very diplomatic about it, but how do you how are you <laughs> feeling about it? Uh, I, I I think I, I I can say this, you know, keeping in mind that I work for you know a, a democratic uh, media establishment, so to speak. Um, I don't think there is a single human being on the face of the planet, and we're talking about a billion people just rolling around trying to go through their life. Not one of those 8 billion people is excited by the prospect of Joe Biden. Mm -hmm. Not one, not one, not even Joe Biden's wife. It's not like people are walking around going, I am so fucking stoked for the Biden presidency. Woo! Nobody's, people are just like, please just fucking just make Trump go away. I I don't care. Like, who, who's he running against? A ham sandwich? Great, I'm voting for a ham sandwich. Like, in this, in this analogy, yeah, Biden is the ham sandwich. Like, you're not excited by it, but you're going to eat it because you're hungry. And the other choice is a painful, starving death. And while that's not very sexy or exciting, if you're on the left, you know, this compared to totalitarian fascism hurtling towards you at 80 miles an hour, probably more palatable. So I, I honestly think that most people who are who are out there who are excited by the prospect of this election no they they're not elected they're not excited by Biden the candidate they're they're excited by the prospect of not even a return to normalcy just like vectoring away from heading right towards the sun at warp 9 like like at this point like somebody's got to pump on the brakes or some shit cuz it's no, like no. I told you when we started, man, it's exhausting. The yeah. Trump presidency has been exhausting. Yeah, yeah. And this whole country, top to bottom, pillar to post, is just we're wiped out, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Really. Yeah, it's, like it's... more than anything else. Like we're just he's exhausting. Like it's just watch that. I watched that last debate with Biden and I was literally like, I'm more tired than Joe Biden now at the end of that debate. And that ended at like 11 p.m., which is like five hours past his bedtime. And I was more exhausted than he was from listening to two hours of Trump. I'm just oh God, like, so, it, somebody's got to end the nightmare, man. That's just, that's where we're at. So I, 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 I it's what it is, man. <laughs> it is what it is, as Trump has it. Um, 200,000 dead. It is what it is. James, uh, you know, we've spoken a lot of, about um, um, making it hard for, for, for people to vote, uh, slowing down the mailing system. There's been all the shit fuckery with the USPS, which we made an honest government ad about. There's been voter intimidation. There's been purges. 1.7 million people taken off the rolls over the last two years. So many different things. Clo uh, closing polling stations, which has been causing these long queues in many places. Um, has any? Do you think there's a potential for this to actually have backfired? <laughs> On Trump, in this, what I mean is, has this these almost obvious attempts um, to deprive people of the right to vote actually encouraged people to turn out and vote? Because I'm looking at the numbers; it's a record, and I know there's also a pandemic that's causing people to sort of not want to actually go and vote on election day. But it, nevertheless, the numbers are amazing. We've got a rec as of now, I think the latest number is 80 million Americans have already voted. Um, at this stage in, in 2016, only about 47 had, million had voted. So 58% of the total 2016 turnout has already voted in this election. Do you think that there's a sense that it's a backfire on Trump? Is that, is that, is that, does that ring true to you that actually I, people have gone? You know I, I would say the you. left. If my vote, <laughs> if you're trying so hard to take my vote away, it really counts. I'm going to go and vote. Fuck you, you know? Maybe. I'd, uh, I, I'd say it's a combination of... Uh, it's difficult to tell now just because of the Rona. And again, like you guys didn't get slapped as hard as we did because, you know, our rugged individualism meant that we would just keep passing the pandemic back and forth until, you know, we just started throwing everybody's grandma into the volcano to make Moloch happy. Like that's kind of like our plan. Well, it's worth um, a try. It's, you know, it's a good, <laughs> you gotta, gotta test that idea. I, I, I honestly like, like I, I will know. So if you look at the 2016 turnout, it was roughly 65 million to 62 million, Hillary Clinton, Donald Trump, which is roughly, you know, buck and a quarter, 130 million people voted. Out of 300 million, roughly 220 million people are registered. You're talking, we got about a 60% turnout last year. So the question becomes, what's the total turnout of registered voters and TOTO for the entire voting season? Because again, the early voting could just be the because... Because because of the Rona, especially in states where it's starting to pick up now. You know, yeah. in America two weeks ago, we were looking honky dory. Everything was great. Like cities were opening back up, like things were returning to normal. And all of a sudden it's starting to spike again. You know why? 
because people are standing out in line to vote. Why? Because they still think it's going to be safer than doing it on election day when the polls are going to be swamped because we keep closing polling locations. It's it's a clusterfuck and there's no way to know now because it's there's so much fuckery on such a large scale that you honestly need more data before you actually know what happened. Uh, and I think election night, you're going to know a lot yeah. on, on election night. Um, you, you're going to know what states people came out early, um, if they came out strong, how many votes are left on the table. Uh, you'll know if there's states that have Republican or Democratic governors who are going to play nice with Trump. Uh, I really think most of your questions are going to get answered on election night, but the big one's not going to get answered until January. Yeah. In case you haven't got the message, vote. If you if you haven't voted already, vote now. Drop off your vote. Go to a, uh, or vote on election day. Don't mail it in. And after the elections, make sure that all votes are counted. Like when when that when that shit show happens, don't just go. Oh well, we'll let the Supreme Court decide. Like th that is not going to work out well. We've already well, seen what so, happens. So, so here's an important note for that. Yes, this more than likely will end up with the Supreme Court. But you have to remember, before it goes to the Supreme Court, because here in America, it states the states are broken down into voting districts, which go along essentially with counties. Maybe sometimes you have two counties in a voting district. Every voting district, every poll, every polling location has polling captains. Every voting district has a, a voter board. And a lot of what they do is open to the public, especially as it relates to uh, recounting and counting manual ballots. So early on in this, the first couple of weeks after the election, if people, if, if you know, going out and protesting this sort of thing, if you want to, you know, you really want to push and say, we want everybody's vote counted. We want the, the vote to be as accurate as possible. Like we don't want lawyers settling this. Uh, local is normally where you get the goods. Because you can lean on a local election board. You can have, you know, if 30% of the people in a county come out to an election board and protest the shit out of non-counts or, you know, election officials just sort of punting it up to the state. Like, you don't want that. Because once that, that gets punted to the state, the state punts to federal, federal punts to SCOTUS. And the next thing you know, you got Kavanaugh and Roberts deciding who the president is, as opposed to, you know, three polling captains, 12 vote counters, and, you know, three election officials that are, you know, put in place by a county board as opposed to the Supreme Court. Because, again, once it gets into that back room, they, that's it. Yeah. it it's, it's over. Uh, at least at least the, the preliminary portions of counting, like if you watched any of the primaries, in a lot of the primaries, you'd see where they would have uh, they'd have to have count offs because it was very close during the primaries. And there's literally people have cell phone video, put it on Twitter of, you know, election people sitting at a table in a gymnasium somewhere going through them, like putting one here, one here, like manually counting them. So there is some point at which a lot of votes are manually tabulated and that process is open to the public, but it's early on. And unfortunately, early on right now looks like Sixth Avenue in New York City with boarded up buildings because they're expecting the purge. So we are we are off the edge of the map, man. I, I don't know what the hell else they got lined up on the back row, but I'm going to assume they have something else lined up because they've spent the last 10 years pretty much slapping everybody in the face at the last minute. It's the one thing they've been doing consistently other than putting brown people in cages. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't expect them to just go gently into that good night, and I don't expect them to roll into an election without a plan knowing that Trump has a top line of the amount of votes he's going to get. Like, it's not like Trump can't be a populist. Trump's not going to, they know Trump's top line numbers, 60 billion, 61 million, 62 million, whatever. So everything is about how do you turn down votes? How do you suppress the vote? How do you see QAnon fitting in? We've, we've made an honest government ad where we try to draw that connection um, between QAnon and the election, uh, which ties into everything that we've spoken about. What, from your perspective, you've spoken a bit about QAnon, c c just to take us out uh, on, a, on, a, on a happy note. <laughs> um, well, well it, it depends. Do, do I have to be as nice about this and political about this as you have been? Because I'm the one who's knee deep in QAnon. So uh, no, you go, can I just you swing do, for the fences on this one? Can I? Thing. Go for it. Um, all right. So QAnon is a full on overpacked bag of nutters. Um, it is the worst part of Scientology, numerology, and probably fucking cosmetology all rolled up into one. 
and it's dangerous as hell. And of course, Trump's not going to disavow them because Trump's not in a position to lose any votes. Like we just said, he has a top line number. He only has so many votes. Now, honestly, I don't think he's hanging on to QAnon because at some point he's going to want to unleash an army of nutters to go out and, you know, start committing street crimes or blowing things up. Like, I, I don't think he's he's doing that. He just literally wants the votes. And he likes the idea that there are people out there filling up search engines and algorithms with his name. Like, that's the only crap Trump really cares about. Um, now, I, I'm actually concerned about QAnon. I, I have I have maybe two or three friends, like people I went to college with years ago and since, you know, they found God and got married and had kids and bought a house. And now all of a sudden they're QAnon people and they're like in their 40s. Like, and this happened out of nowhere. And so, so like, I've actually watched this happen and I understand the kind of people who are getting sucked into the QAnon. And again, the, a lot of these people are not people who are going to go out with an AR and open fire out in the streets because Trump loses. Um, what they will do is post the messages and ideas of the people that do. Yeah. And that's why QAnon is so, I, I don't want to say frightening because frightening is probably the wrong word, but why they're so dangerous is because they have their hands on the levers of algorithms. And as you and I know, if the algorithm is the difference between life and death when you're talking about digital messaging in this day and age. And when you have a dedicated army of hundreds of thousands of people, the majority of which are suburban, white, have enough money that they have a computer and high-speed internet, and they're not just dicking around on their cell phone. And these are the people who will mass exploit uh, any kind of a social problem. These are the people who can absolutely dogpile a keyword on an algorithm and chase people like Chrissy Teigen off the internet in one shot. And if you have that kind of strength, frankly, if the Oath Keepers or Adam Waffen or the Three Percenters or whoever else decide to go full jihadi Christian civil war, well, these are the people who have the digital megaphone. And, and that's got to be the most concerning thing, because honestly, up until a couple of years ago, chuckleheads like me were the people who controlled the digital megaphone, and it was a much smaller megaphone. Mm -hmm. And, you know, QAnon has hundreds of thousands of people listening to these messages, mm -hmm. you know, waiting to decipher the next drop. Like, these people are full on dangerous, because no matter what happens, they're going to have an excuse. You know, oh, Trump lost. Hold on. Let's see what Q says. Do -do 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 the drop comes out, you know. Q says, Trump lost because the deep state, you know, packed the ballot boxes, uh, you know, get the Democrats and they'll all like go and, you know, I don't know, burn down City Hall or something. But I don't think these are the armed reactionaries as opposed to the militia people. But it's, it's two different things. Yeah. But in many ways, they're more frightening than the militia people. Yeah. But I mean, the, th the interesting thing is that the, the this um, this this effort, this militia people on the streets are accompanied by a different cohort, which are militias. On the internet so they kind of go together i don't know if this is an organized thing but my god it looks quite you know it looks quite orchestrated and you kind of go hmm i wonder why we'll find out when uh, the cia <laughs> releases the fucking uh, tapes i'm sure i'm sure 40 years from now when the when the redacted notes come out about this mm. people are really going to be scratching their head going how the hell did this thing like get so much traction like because yeah. it's, it's just so ludicrously unbelievable but but again, like we're the country who sold the National Enquirer in, in supermarkets until like the 1990s, and it was still selling like fucking 60 million copies. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. in, in America, it's just we love that. Like the more, what's that? There's a Bigfoot sighting. I'll plunk down my dollar to read your newspaper, even though I know there's no Bigfoot, because I'm an American and I want to be entertained by the biggest pile of shit you can come up with. Like, right. it's what we do, man. If you have any questions. Go watch Point Break again, okay? And then come back to me. Like, literally what we do here in America. You're such a great spokesperson for your country. Look, I can't say, um, I can't say we're any better. We, often people say, oh, I thought Australia was a lovely place until I watched your videos, you know? And I just want to make it clear that actually Australia is a wonderful place. It's a beautiful country. We just have a really shit government, and it's important to make that, that distinction between the, those two people, those two things. Um, and uh, James, thanks very much for your analysis. A little while we were chatting, um, a little while ago we were chatting and I remember I said, oh, you know, this is, um, I want to make an honest government ad about, you know, how, how the US is a failed state. And you said, what's failed about it? This is, ex it's working exactly as it's, as it's intended. And I, I feel like you've, um, you know, I, I encourage people who, um, 
can tolerate uh, the super cynical, but also very uh, factually, um, you know, you, you really research stuff and, you know, you, 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 in your show, you're always kind of like really anchoring it into, uh, into um, reality and sort of keeping things real and informing people with some decent research. So I encourage people to check out your work. We'll put the, where can people find you? I'll put the link in the show notes and the video description. My videos are on YouTube. I put out one a day every day. A lot of it's about QAnon. A lot of it's about, uh, you know, the the disillusion of, of whatever's left of, quote, the American dream. Uh, I focus a lot on this. And, you know, after the election, much like you, I think I'm going to be really hyper focused on the battle after the election to decide who wins the election. Because, mm -hmm. like I said, man, it, it, it's like we got eight weeks of overtime. That's what we got. It's like the game's over. We still we got another eight weeks of overtime to go. So uh, strap in, everybody. It's just starting now. <laughs> oh, I'm super excited though. I was, I'm totally glad I got to get up with you again, Giordano. Uh, you are you are always fun to talk to. I uh, you always remind me that people around the world are actually looking at us, and it makes me even more embarrassed for people to know that I'm an American. So. I, I thank you for that gift every time I see you. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks so much for joining us, James. Hopefully we'll have you back. Take care. Good luck for next week and the, and the weeks ahead. And thanks for all the work you do. Stay safe, everybody. Well, that brings us to the end of this episode of the Juice Media Podcast. We'd like to wish all our US listeners all the best for the election next week and the weeks ahead. We'll be following really closely what happens right up until Inauguration Day, because as James said, we might not know until then the final outcome of this election. If you enjoyed the podcast, please recommend it to your friends and family. And if you value what we do here, you can help us to keep doing it by supporting us on Patreon. A special thanks to all our patrons who make it possible for us to make the podcast and the Honest Government ads, and a special shout out in particular to our patron producers who are the backbone of the Juice Media. You've been listening to the Juice Media podcast with me, Giordano. We'll be back very soon with our next Honest Government ad. Until then, take care.